Struggle is my address with pain and crack lips. Gunshots coming from sounds of blackness. Given this game with no time to practice. Born on a blacklist. Told I'm below average. A life with no cabbage. That's no money if you're from where I'm from. Funny, I just want some of your son. Dark clouds seem to follow me. Alcohol that my pop swallow bottle me. No apology, I walk with a bold on my shoulder. It's a cold war. I'm a colder soldier. Hold the same fight that made Martin Luther the king. I ain't using it for the right thing. In between lean and the fiends, hustle and the schemes. I put together pieces of a dream. I still have one. I got a dream. Looking in the mirror, images of me getting much clearer, dear self. I wrote a letter just to better my soul. If I don't express it, then forever I hold inside. I'm from a side where we gotta control. Rap music and the hood play the fatherly role. My story, like yours, yo, gotta be told. Trying to make it from a gangster to a gallia role. Red scrolls are stole slaves. The Jewish people in cold cage. Hate has no color or age. Slip the page. Now my race became freedom. Right dreams in the dark, they far, but I can see them. I believe in heaven more than hell. Blessings more than jail. In the ghetto, let love prevail. With a story to tell, my eyes see the glory. And well, the world waiting for me to yell. I have a dream. I got a dream. One day. We're gonna work it out. out, out.
Good evening to all who have joined us today. Uh, my name is Ashley Allen, the Director of the Office of Student Inclusion and Diversity here at Augustana College. Our office has the privilege to lead Augustana, Augustana's annual MLK Day program to celebrate and commemorate the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This year, we extended this celebration to host our first MLK week. As a community member, this is one of two virtual programs you can be a part of. Feel free to visit us at www.augustana.edu slash MLK to learn how you can participate in our virtual experience with the National Civil Rights Museum on this Wednesday. MLK Week has, was made possible because of the tremendous support of those across our campus community and organizations in the Quad Cities. Thank you to those who have played an integral part of MLK Week. And a special thanks to Dr. Sharon Varallo, the staff and student ambassadors in my office who worked hard and in the planning and preparation of this week. As I think about the community that we strive for at Augustana College, I think about Dr. King's vision of a beloved community, a vision to bring people together in pursuit of justice, opportunity, and love of one another, regardless of race, color, or creed. He helped people to see and strive towards something bigger, something better, and something stronger. In a 1956 speech, facing the challenge of a new age, Dr. King stated, the end is reconciliation, the end is redemption, and the end is the creation of the beloved community. He goes on to say, it is this type of spirit and this type of love that transforms opposers into friends. It is this understanding that transforms gloom into gladness and brings about miracles in the hearts of people. Although we have come a long way, 66 years later, we are facing the challenges of a new age. As we celebrate Dr. King's legacy, let us reflect on the individual and collective parts we play towards reconciliation, societal redemption, and the creation of a beloved community. It is my hope that we are reminded of the transformative power within us. Our voices, our dreams, and our actions will bring change and move us closer to Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. Let us reflect on the call to bring people together, bridge equity gaps, and provide hope and opportunities for social change. Once again, I want to thank you all for joining us on this evening. Next, we will have remarks shared by our Augustana president, Steve Balls. Well, good evening and welcome to our 2020 annual MLK Day celebration. Thank you, Ashley, director of our student diversity and inclusion efforts for those beautiful words. Thank you, Dr. Smith, uh, our Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for your work at Augustana College. And welcome back to the virtual podium, Dr. Dwight Ford, a great friend of Augustana College. Thank you to the many community organizations who are participating this evening. I love the theme for this, this evening and it embodies many of the values of Augustana College. Redemption, carrying on MLK's vision of the beloved community and today's programs reflecting on Dr. King's call to bring people together, bridge equity gaps, and provide hope and opportunities for social change. This is my 19th MLK Day celebration at Augustana College. And in those 19 years, we've seen a dramatic increase in the diversity of our students, faculty, and board. We've won national awards, but what is most pleasing to me is this community's effort to promote social justice. I'm so proud of our students for working together to build a better community, to address, address issues of racial justice, economic justice, social justice, and environmental justice. I'm so proud of our alumni and faculty for aiding in these efforts. And I'm proud to be a member of the Quad Cities community as the Quad Cities community within the past few years has taken justice issues much more seriously. We do have, however, a distance to go. In his historic I Have a Dream speech during the 1963 March on Washington, Dr. King declared, we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. He was quoting the prophet Amos, 
the prophet Amos was trying to make the point that it is not just enough to worship. Rather, we must be aware of our surroundings and we must act to ensure that there is justice in our communities. So here is what I would say today. It's not enough for us to generally support diversity, equity, and inclusion. We must be aware of what's happening around us to our brothers, sisters, and neighbors. We must call out injustice and we must engage ourselves in ensuring more justice at Augustana College, in the Quad Cities, and throughout the United States. I'm so proud of Augustana students, faculty, alumni, and community members for answering the call to justice. Dr. Sharon Varallo, the founder of our education, Augustana Education and Prison Program, is a real role model. She believes in justice. She believes in redemption. She believes in community, all consistent with our themes today. She embodies the prophet Micah, who says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? That is my wish for the Augustana community and the Quad City community, that we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly, that we are doers, not observers, in advancing racial and social justice in our community. Thank you, Ashley, for the opportunity to make a few comments. Hello, I'd like to thank Ashley Allen, the director of the Office of Student Inclusion and Diversity for having me sing a couple tunes in honor to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day.
break through the shell, throw it away and reveal your true soul. Break through the shell, throw it away. That was a song that was written and sung by Rock Island's very own Charlotte Blue. Um, Charlotte is a senior at Rock Island High School. She has a passion for music and aspires to use her gifts to uplift and spread positive vibes for years to come. Um, you can hear from Charlotte at charlotteblue.com. She is currently working on her debut EP that will be released in mid-2022. At this time, I am so excited to introduce our moderator for tonight's program. Reverend Dwight Ford is an innovative leader, author, thought provoker, and public theologian. He is affectionately known as the people's pastor for his commitment to vulnerable populations and impoverished communities. He is a United States Marine Corps veteran. Reverend Ford holds degrees from Western Illinois University, Harvard University, and is currently completing his doctoral studies at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in a joint program with the Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University. He is the senior pastor of Grace City Church in Rock Island, Illinois, and executive director of Project Now, Inc. Community Action Agency, leading three counties of anti-poverty initiatives. Reverend Dwight Ford is married to Dr. Argro Kit Evans Ford, and together they have two children, Imani and Justice. At this time, I want to welcome Reverend Dwight Ford. Thank you, Ashley, for that very warm and winsome uh, introduction. I am so glad to be a part of tonight's conversation. As a matter of fact, I want you to think of tonight as a conversation. There'll be an opportunity for us to engage and to uh, move forward with dialogue, to ask questions, to learn more, to journey. But what's most important about tonight is that we have a chance to continue the rich and long legacy of Dr. King in the area of reimagining uh, ideas and what the future could look like, the commitment to rewriting narratives, and what it would take for us to recommit to the ideals of justice and new ways as we move society forward. With that said, one of our guest tonight. Of course, she's not a guest to some, but Dr. Sharon Borello, for those who did not make it to this morning's or earlier presentation that may not know of her, she is a communication studies professor at Augustana and the founder and executive director of Augustana's prison education program. Uh, listen, that in and of itself uh, is something to be lauded and something to be praiseworthy of because it's such a great initiative for the audience members, again, that did not make it this morning and maybe don't know a little bit about this wonderful initiative, I want to lay the foundation of just thinking of how Dr. King was presented to most in 1963, of course, the March on Washington. But many did not know he had 
nine years earlier began that work. And so it takes a certain event, takes a certain introduction for some people to get connected. Could you let individuals know that this has been in the pipeline? What partners, how did this all come about? I want people to get the genesis and the work that has already been uh, put into motion that you and others have committed to. Thank you so very much. Such an honor to be on this panel with you. Um, it's hard to know what from what beginning, right, to start. So um, definitely uh, one genesis was um, an experience of, an, of injustice inside my own family. Um, that was in 2013. Um, and after that, um, about four years ago, three Augustana faculty started volunteering at East Moline Correctional Center. And two years after that, um, Augustana granted me a sabbatical. And on that sabbatical, I wrote major grant proposals. And today, as a result of that, um, the, the great generosity of the Austin E. Knowlton Foundation, Augustana College now has basically a satellite campus in the East Moline Correctional Center. So starting small with seed funding, but seed funding is about a quarter of a million dollars that the foundation entrusted to us to do what we should be doing, to be in the community, doing what we do, not just um, you know, thinking about beloved community and in, in stretching our vision of what that means. The East Moline Correctional Center is eight miles down the road from Augustana College. We should be in our community. And indeed, um, it is just absolutely the work and the honor of my life to be able uh, to be doing this work. And so would, would you like me to tell you a little bit about, about how we started this past fall? Absolutely, I... <laughs> please. <laughs> so it was a nail biter this summer, but we got started in August and admitted 10 students who are currently incarcerated at East Moline, that is um, men who are incarcerated at East Moline, and um, it's a cohort-based system where they are pursuing an Augustana College bachelor's degree in four years, just like they might um, on Augustana's campus, taking courses that Augustana professors would ordinarily teach on campus. Those professors are getting security clearances and going into the prison and teaching in the classroom there. So we had hoped to have the cohort size be a bit bigger, but pandemic has limited us so that this, this first year we have 10 students, but they are mighty and they are paving the road and they did marvelous. So they took 14 credits in the fall. That was, it's a very full term over five courses and seven out of those 10 students with the bar very high earned a spot on the Dean's list. 10 out of 10 found that they can do rigorous college work and do it well. And all five of the faculty that finished in fall term were just, we were just very, very proud of the work that they put in. They write their papers by hand. They did all of the same sort of work that Augustana College students do on campus, including research papers with multiple drafts, with, um, you know, referring to sources that we could bring in from the library to get approved. And so we're building the road as we're walking on it basically. And, um, but they knocked it out of the park. And so we had a successful in-person fall semester and currently now EMCC is in lockdown. And so we, we are dropping off books and picking up homework via the mailroom. But, um, yeah, that's just a little, in a nutshell, just a bit about the Augustana Prison Education Program, which we refer to as APEP. Thank you so much, Dr. Barallo. I'm so glad that you took time to really help people to understand how this came about. Uh, there's a personal commitment. There's also a communal commitment where people have partnered together. And again, just making the connection with Dr. King, when Dr. King shows up as one of the speakers, uh, in 1963 at the March on Washington, he stood alongside of other organizations. They were referred to as the big six, the National Urban League, NEACP, CORE, SNCC, and of course, SCLC. And then of course, uh, kind of the godfather of the movement uh, with the Brotherhood of Sleeping uh, Car Porters. This is how movement making happens. It's never done in isolation. 
It is always done in tandem apart with partnerships uh, that allow funding. And now to learn of your great effort to continue even amid COVID and its challenges. Again, uh, our hats are tip to the students there that are doing a marvelous job. Part of our commitment tonight is also to kind of widen the understanding of partnerships and initiatives that have lent themselves to the local effort as well. And I would like to introduce Mr. Dewan Tatro. He's, listen, he's one of the students featured in, throughout the film. And if you haven't had a chance yet, I hope that you would get a chance to review the, docu the documentary and the film itself. It's a wonderful production. Uh, and of course, the narratives and the life uh, witness uh, brings to bear so much of their personhood and opportunities that lie for so many. But he is BPI's Government Affairs Officer and the Senior Advisor of Strategic Outreach for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee's Diversity and Inclusion Department. He was also on BPI's debate team, which famously beat Harvard. I needed to say that, my alma mater. I'm so glad that you participated with that. Uh, Dewan, can you please tell us just a bit about BPI's Consortium for the Liberal Arts in Prison, because this is narrative sh shifting. This is a rewriting narratives. Could you give us an understanding, sir? Sure, Dwight. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm really, really happy to be here with you all um, this evening. Um, I'm currently in Washington, D.C. And let's talk about um, the Consortium for Liberal Arts. And so, you know, BPI started doing college and prison um, over 20 years ago here in New York. Um, and we sort of um, expanded our footprint here in New York, but we were doing what we were doing in such a transformational way that we constantly got the question, and we still get it in New York, how can you be bigger? How can you serve? more students? How can you, Bard College, the Bard Prison Initiative, reach more people? And the answer has always been that honestly, we can, right? The work that we do, the success that we have been able to achieve over the past 20 years is embedded in the fact that what we do happens at a small scale. It happens at a human scale that it is personal work. All of our classes at BPI are small seminar style classes and our two incarcerated students receive the same exact type of learning as our students on the main Annandale campus, right? Um, we have professors who wake up some days and drive to work on campus. And some of those who um, drive to work in any of the satellite campuses within the prisons, right? And so our professors are not gonna drive to Illinois. Right. And so we need colleges and universities across the country doing what we're doing in order to scale college and prison, right, to what we call mass incarceration in this country. Right. And so about 10 years ago, BPI started the Consortium for Liberal Arts in Prison. And through that initiative, we have worked to build in 13 different states, college and prison programs with 16 different partners, right? And so Augustana is our newest partner, but other colleges and universities in that consortium range from Notre Dame to Grinnell, to Yale, to Boston College, to Emerson, to Goucher. So some of the best colleges and universities in the country, right, are now doing what Bard College does through BPI in their own respective communities in reaching students that we can't reach in a wit, a real and rigorous and human way from New York. Thank you so much, Dewan, because I think just understanding how connected this consortium is and how it lends itself to one another, and it helps spread a network out of individuals being impacted professors, uh, those that are in support staff as well. I'm glad that you are in a integral part of this network that allows so many feeder systems and streams and tributaries to be widened because of your effort. Uh, we appreciate all that you have done and what you're continuing to do alongside of so many others. Uh, tonight, we've been thinking about redemption and this whole idea of how do we help put another brick uh, on the building, so to speak, of the beloved community. 
I want to come back to Dr. Varello uh, quickly here to talk about, you know, Dr. King put at four this idea of healing communities. How do we find space and make space for individuals that uh, are in need of community? Uh, and with that in, in mind, how does this understanding of healing community from what you've seen and what you personally witnessed in your program, how, how does it materialize? What does it feel like and look like in that space? Healing community feels like and looks like relief from suffering. There is suffering at the heart of, of higher ed and prison, I believe, right? Suffering for, for you know, in, for the, the whole scenario of mass incarceration to begin with. Restorative, so, so redemption, it's important, I think, for us to remember that that's about the redemption of society's soul. It's about collective redemption for, for what we have not been doing and how we have not been acting um, in beloved community. And so, and we all can do our part there, and this is just what we should be doing, right? And so what I see it as is I see one of, okay, so we have 10 APEP students and I'm envisioning them right now. And one of my students was in his first year of college um, at the same time as his son on the outside was in his first year of college, right? I see um, another, another man in my class whose daughter made a little TikTok of her father on television talking about going to college in prison on the one day that we had cameras in and was able, you know, and those cameras were able to capture a bit about that classroom, kind of like college behind bars. College behind bars shows the world how, how beautiful people are in prison that there are humanity just like just like anyone else right and so with different personalities and quirks and you know some of my students are silly and serious and all kinds of ev everything in collective redemption is healing of a whole community it's knowing that you can be all of us can be role models all of us can be um play a a, a really important part in um sort of uh, you know, in, in bringing healing to our whole community. Does that begin to answer your question? Absolutely. The, I'm, I'm glad you, you painted the picture of what happens even in those spaces. Sometimes individuals think that uh, certain locations or certain settings are the place for healing. Healing transpires where there has been a broken uh, reality, where there has been a separation, where there has been a reaching toward each other. And I'm so glad to know that the testimony and the witness of so many, and just in a moment, we're getting ready to watch a portion of the redemption story uh, as we are, are preparing for that clip. Um, I wanna just set the stage by giving you one of my favorite lines uh, in the award-winning play by Peter Schaefer, Equius, where a psychiatrist is talking with a patient and he says, uh, well, we all need a story to help us see in the dark. I pray and hope that this uh, narrative and this story that is captured in this documentary will help so many others continue to see in the dark. Let's pause here now on purpose and lean in and take a good viewing of this clip and we'll come back on the other side. I've been incarcerated for 13 years. And from my experience, I can tell you, prison is here to punish us. Um, it's here to warehouse us. But it's not about um, rehabilitating. It's not about creating um, productive beings. It just isn't.
Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely. Having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on the show, I thought I would sell about a little and see the watery part of the world. I'm taking Moby Dick. Oh, that's a really interesting class. The whole first paragraph we had to memorize. And each one of us had to recite in front of the rest of the class. You would see another guy in the class in the yard, and we would be like, um, hey, call me Ishmael. And he would go through it, and I would go through it, and we'd point out where we didn't match. I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. Is the way I have of regulating the spleen and try and uh, regulating the. Is the way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my high poster gets such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping out into the streets and methodically knocking people's hats off their heads, then I account it high time to get to see as soon as I can. How would you feel about that? We gotta remember that the crisis that the United States was in in the early 1930s was a global economic crisis. And that crisis led to the rise of all kinds of anti-democratic regimes all over the world. And what Roosevelt's concerned about is the possibility that this could happen in the United States. We are not a part of the prison system. We are a college who happens to have classes inside a prison Unlike other schools, it has bars, it has gates that close and open, it has doors that must be locked. Although we say school building, it's not a traditional school building. Although what we do inside the school building is traditional college work. One of the things that's always been most important to us is the institution's adamance that these students, the incarcerated students, are no different from any other. And in many ways, BPI is simply a very simple kind of experiment, which is what happens when we provide the kinds of education that typically in the United States are only afforded to the children of the lucky or the entitled or the rich to others. Do not get rid of any draft. So you can see there's a lot of rewrites. I spend most of my time in the school building. Um, if I'm in this cell more often than not, I'm either reading, writing, or sleeping. Um, this, is, this is a cell. This is not a place that I live in.
Well, as you can see, there's no pictures or posters on the wall at all. I keep this bare. I don't forget that this is prison, even when I'm working. Because at some point, me an officer is going to walk past this cell. I'm going to hear the keys jangling on his belt. And he might stop by that cell and look through that window there. And so I don't forget. You never forget. I do most of my work at night because it's a dorm, it's an open space. There are a lot of distractions, you know, guys walking around, talking loudly. It's not always easy to uh, focus on the schoolwork, so I may start so a lot of my work maybe at 11 at night and go to bed 2 or 3 in the morning. I try to be as organized as I can be in such a small space. So, I, you know, I utilize, like, little folders and things. Uh, miscellaneous papers papers for every semester, for every class, for the last five years. I came in when I was 16. I got my GED on Rikers Island in 2005. A friend of mine forced me into the program, which is probably the kindest, most loving thing anyone has ever done for me. It forced me to apply to this program. Just all textbooks, math, science, and then, of course, Spanish is invading my life. So that's my, for the next two and a half years, it will be Spanish, biology, math. I keep myself very Spartan and school-oriented as a buffer against prison life. Prison can get inside of you, it's invasive, and I try to keep it out. And school is by one of the means that I keep it out. I majored in German studies. The language was so hard. However, now, I love to read about American news in German. One of the things that really attracted me about Germany was its historical mistake and then the manner in which it tried to really make up for that mistake. This is my cell. This is where I uh, rest my head, uh, get my thoughts together, do my schoolwork. You have my sink. Uh, my window. You see, I don't have much of a view of much out there, but it's all right. Definitely look forward to having a different environment when I get out. Now I gotta make the most of what I have, you know? The overwhelming majority of our students will be sent back to the communities typically from which they came and will engage with their families and those communities. And they will be better at that when they're educated in a way that's meaningful to them. Welcome back. That was just a short clip from the documentary College Behind Bars which can be watched in its entirety on PBS, uh, Amazon, and Netflix. So you have a choice there. And uh, my sincere hope is that you would take some time out and away from the regular commitments and spend some time watching and listening and learning 
uh, from the experiences. And before we begin our discussion tonight, I wanna welcome into the conversation and introduce for the first time, Mr. Giovanni Hernandez and Mr. Jewel Hall. Both of them, of course, are featured throughout the film that we just saw the short clip from. Uh, Giovanni is a social justice advocate, public speaker, and government affairs associate for Adams Advisors in New York City. And Jewel has worked for the Ford Foundation and Amazon and is now a freelance consultant for documentary film, higher education in prison, and criminal justice reform. Welcome to the both of you. Now, we've been talking about Dr. King and the beloved community. Uh, he has so many uh, experiences that are noted. What gives you hope or what inspires you from the life and the experiences of Dr. King? What have you grabbed hold of to say, this is my part of the journey? Great, we can start with Giovanni, please, first, and then we'll go right to Jewel. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Ford, um, and, um, or Reverend Ford, rather. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> um, and uh, once again, thank you all for having me. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm always super excited for, at these events to engage with individuals and just, you know, it's a really important conversation for me that really matters um, to, my, to me as well. Um, and I think that for me, what I got from it is, um, you know, uh, Dr. King's fight, um, his struggles, you know, for uh, a, a more just, a more equitable society, one um, in which we all have, you know, we all actually have the same opportunities, you know, not one which is divisive, but one which is, you know, an embodiment of this beloved community. Um, we, we've been speaking, you know, we have been hearing about all night, um, is the fact that up until I had access to this education, you know, this level of education, I didn't consider myself a part of that beloved community. Mm -hmm. um, I considered a part of, you know, my very small neighborhood community, right? Um, and anything outside of that had, you know, I, I had no relationship to outside of those people who I knew growing up, the people, you know, my family, my friends, the people who I engage with on a daily basis. Um, but, you know, I had, you know, learning and having access to this, um, this education really expanded my mind such that, you know, I understood how um, I played a role into this wider idea of citizenship um, and made me really feel my connection to everyone else and everyone else is connected to myself. Um, and I think that that for me um, is sort of my entry point to his struggle is that now I feel my, I, I, I feel that it's my duty that if I can help in something, that it is my duty to help in something. And I think that that's part of, um, that is also an aspect of this beloved community. I really appreciate that. And uh, putting the onus back on oneself that if I can, then it's my responsibility to do what I can do when I can do it. And so we thank you for kind of elevating that. That's something that's important to you. Uh, how about you, Jewel? What is it that you have found uh, as we think about beloved community redemption, Dr. King's life, his words, his actions that you hold on to? Well, what I hold on to is the sacrifice, the tolerance, and the struggle that King and his contemporaries went through to ensure the equity of all people, uh, particularly people of color. I have went to public school as, as a youngin and really saw school as a joke. I mean, is we could talk about community influence, my peers and the way uh, school wasn't, at least in my neighborhood, it wasn't cool to be smart. However, once I learned about King and the sacrifices, he gave his life for me to be able to go to school and to be able to vote and to be able to uh, enter the, the, the labor market in a, in a way that's meaningful for me. So that just put me in a whole new perspective of what my duty is and how I should respond to society. I should also be willing to struggle. I should also be willing to sacrifice. I should also put my best foot forward, even if it means my life for the beloved community. And that is the poor, the oppressed, and people under underserved in society. I really like how you tied those in. 
to help give people an understanding to poor, the oppressed, the underserved, people that are on the margins, those that are pushed out, run out, kicked out, left out for so many different reasons. And so part of our conversation is finding new ways to strengthen the work that is uh, begun, that has begun and currently engaged in, but it's also to welcome new individuals into this work. And what I appreciate about King as I come back to Giovanni for this question, and uh, I wanna go around uh, kind of the horn, so to speak, and invite all of our guests to kind of respond. This is a good opportunity for us to engage in mutual dialogue. When Dr. King in uh, 64, December 10th, receives the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize in his acceptance speech, he frames it this way, I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. He says, all peoples everywhere, whether they're incarcerated or not, uh, whether individuals are poor or not. He said that this should be the fabric of our humanity. And so when we think about what that takes, uh, I think, Jewel, you mentioned that sacrifice. Dr. King spent 13 of his years, the last 13, of, 13 years of his life, doing one thing and one thing only. It consumed him. It was a nonstop since the Montgomery bus boycott all the way into Memphis balcony, standing between room 306 and 305 and the assassin's bullet cutting down. That essentially was a nonstop roller coaster. His body began to break down. He had um, convulsions and he had hiccups that were uncontrollable. You could not tell it. Uh, he had to be hospitalized for uh, dehydration and exhaustion. Andrew Young, his colleague and uh, friend, uh, said that he had a war on sleep. He suffered with insomnia. He fought depression uh, 13 years, death threats every day. And so when we think about what it takes really to push America forward, it wasn't just him giving a few speeches, it was actually the personal sacrifice along with so many others. And he spoke about the institutional changes that we needed to make. His dream, of course, and vision and the work for equality and making that a reality, defending voting rights and ensuring every child has equal access to quality education and demanding social justice, not just for a small slither of society, but for everyone. And so with that said, he would mention that we're inextricably bound in a network of mutuality. What affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. And he would quote John Donne all the time and say that no man is an island unto himself. Hmm. What is it about when we look at society as a whole, we're gonna go back to that uh, point of education, Giovanni. What, what does the lack of access to quality education, I'm talking about good schools, great teachers with high expectation, um, buildings that are suitable for the development of the human mind and the spirit to be in those spaces. What is it about the lack of equal access and quality education that plays a role into mass incarceration? Your thoughts on this? Um, thank you, Atili. That's, that's a question I've like, thought about a lot over the years. Um, you know, like, because in my experience, what was it about this education experience for me that broke me free? Um, you know, and for and I think that it boils down to the fact that my public school education, my education prior to um, bar, the Bar Prison Initiative was one that was very much prescriptive. Um, I spoke about this earlier. It was one in which things were told to me. I was told what I needed to know, what to study, what to think about, you know, my opinions were given to me. Um, and so I think it made me very, um, very made me, made me very much more of a receptacle than a be, than a human being, um, and such. I you know I never had a chance to develop my own ideas and thus my own autonomy. Um, and I think that's something that this you know this uh, experiential quality education did for me was it allowed me to break out free of that mental prison and allow me to grow in my autonomy and make decisions for myself, irrespective of the things that may have been told to me that no longer serve me growing up in this respect of opinions that I developed in my younger years that no longer serve me, that I no longer believed. Um, yeah, I think that that for me was the major difference was um, it, help, it helped me develop myself. It helped me um, sort of obtain the tools to break myself free of mm -hmm. that mental prison. And I think that when people don't have access to that, they have a harder time breaking free of that mental prison and their worlds are much more smaller. Like I referred to that earlier, 
when I went through this education, my world became so much bigger and I was connected mm -hmm. to much more of it. You mentioned how narrow life can be for some, uh, not purposely, it's just sometimes the environment itself uh, prescripts or assigns a uh, certain reality and we have to really work hard to break through that uh, for Jewel or for Dewan, your thoughts on how do you use education or the quality education that now you are the recipient of uh, and thinking about our neighborhoods back home and what does that look like? What does that quality education do and did for you? Good, we'll start with Dewan. Yes, please, thank you. So um, I can jump in. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we, we left at the end of that um, clip with Max Kenner talking about people returning um, back to their communities, right? And so overwhelmingly, what we see in the BPI alumni, alumni community is people getting an education and then returning to their communities and overwhelmingly working on the ground to change the circumstances and conditions that led to their incarceration in the first place, right? For example, the chief of staff of the Bronx Defenders is a BPI alumni, right? Um, some of the individuals who led the Close Rikers campaigns are BPI alumni. You know, Jewel for a long time worked um, at the Ford Foundation doing all types of amazing foundation work that has huge impact on people's lives, right? And we can sort of diddle that all over our alumni communities, right? And so that's the power of an education, of people being education and going back and mobilizing that education back in their communities. And we could easily sort of set the bar in this conversation pretty low and say, well, people get an education and they don't go back to prison. Well, that's true, right? If someone gets um, a bachelor's degree from the Bard Prison Initiative, they are less than four, they are less than 4% likely of going back to prison. That's versus 40%, which is the average in New York, right? And so we're talking a dramatic drop in recidivism, but not only do those people not go back to pr prison, right? That's a low bar, because it's very easy to get set to prison, it's sent to prison in this country. They walk out of prison and they go to Columbia and get master's degrees. They go to Yale and get PhDs. They go to Cornell and get PhDs. Some all over this country, best colleges and universities, and go to achieve things that defy expectations of who college is for and where it might lead, right? And so that's really the power of this, right? The power of this is bringing us as a community, as a nation to recognize the potential of incarcerated people, to acknowledge their humanity, and to create opportunities for them to have the type of lives that we dream of for ourselves, right? And part of that is recognizing, and especially we have to do this today on MLK Day, some of the deep inequities in the society that may lead to people being incarcerated, right? No, I'm glad that you set the stage and talked about the low bar in, in and of itself uh, that we are interested in looking at life investment. I've always thought this, when you invest in the human personality, you will always yield a lifetime of return. When you invest in a person that we as collective yield a lifetime of return. Joel, what about on your end and your thoughts about this very important point in the conversation? Yeah, you know, I can't say nothing to top what Giovanni and Daiwan said. I would like to bring light to one other factor. If we really had a time machine and could reverse back maybe 20, 25 years, the narrative was that there, these people incarcerated couldn't do this work. These yeah. people from these communities cannot do this work. So I, I just want to lift up the fact that the film, the work that, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Varallo is doing is showing that there's people in prison who may have got caught up in what's called the school to prison pipeline. And at a time, uh, the narrative was these people deserve to be in prison and that they shouldn't uh, have access to education. Now, these same people are engaged in these programs in our home 
uh, contributing to society, whether through our taxes or through our social efforts. And many of us are engaged in social justice and social advocacy that is not just based on people incarcerated, but just in the plight of Dr. Martin Luther King for equity for all. Jewel, I wanna come right back to that point and expand your last framing of what's expected, making sure that we understand that things are the way they are because it is a system that continues to have investments in it. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. King would use this Greek term agape uh, for love and it is, and he would give a working definition. Love, agape love is seeing to uh, persevere and create community. It is insistence on community, even when one seeks to break it. Agape is willingness to go to any length to restore community. And what I hear about, about so many uh, that you have lifted up in form of narrative and your colleagues and our guests today about those individuals that have gone beyond that point of saying, how do we keep creating community? I wanna keep this conversation going and first go right to Jewel, then anyone else that would like to take a, a part of this uh, framing of the next question and find your place in the conversation. What, what responsibility does the community have in our mass incarceration crisis. We've just mentioned that the investments, the causing, the allowing, the solving. Do you believe that people actually know that it's a system designed to do what it does so well? Or is it that they have blinders on so much of life, maybe their head is in the phone always. What? How can we help communicate that this is a soul snatching industry? It steals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like to say just quickly, I believe in the optimism of people. And I think this system has a way of constructing narratives and confusing people about what's really the issue. And I think it's important just to have these conversations in a public sphere with people who are, have been impacted. And I don't want to limit my, my notion of impacted as a person who served time. We have families who are impacted by mass incarceration by virtue that their sister or their brother was incarcerated and they had to bear the brunt, the brunt of providing for the family or providing for that sibling who's incarcerated. So I would just say uh, the words of Brian Stevenson ring so true, yeah. get proximate. You have to get close to this issue. You can't just take what you hear from the news. You have to you know, find out what's going on in the local jail in your area, what's going on at the local college campus. And this is how you get proximate. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's go uh, to Giovanni. This idea of getting proximate and how do we in fact uh, take another step forward? What would you recommend to individuals that have uh, maybe have had a, a loved one or a friend that has been incarcerated and saying, and they have been supportive, but not necessarily involved. Taking that one more step, how would you at least convey or be understanding of sometimes the, uh, the reality of not taking one more step. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the last bit? I, I got everything up except the last bit kind of cut out for me. Sure, no problem at all. For those individuals, for whatever reason, we make no judgments um, that have not taken one more step. Uh, they uh, Either they themselves have been directly impacted or with loved ones or friends that have been directly impacted. Uh, they understand, they try not to, to, to bring it up too much, but they're a little apprehensive about taking one more step. And it's that next step that I often find that we have to have encouragement to take. All right, thank you for that. Um, I think that what I would say to the individuals in that position, um, you know, and what I, I is to, you continue to strive to, to learn more and to understand more, to investigate these issues, the issues um, that you may, that may sort of be overlapping, that may affect you in one way or another, um, so you can get a better understanding. And I, and, I, and I guarantee that as you investigate these issues deeply, you will, um, you will uncover sort of what, um, you know, what College Behind Bars was able to do for um, a lot of it's a lot of the arts audiences, and that was you know highlight the personhood of these individuals who are incarcerated in these institutions, right? And when you know when you see someone for the you know 
for the human that they are for the human being, right? When you see someone's humanity, it's you know the, it, what they go through becomes very much more personal to that person. In my right, um, if we're talking about community, right, and um, you know what do we owe others in our community, right? If we consider what, right? If we consider that um, this idea of community is based on, um, you know, I, for me at least, this idea of love for one another, love thus, uh, you know, not in the sense of like I love my family, but I love my neighbor, right? I love the person who, the, the dude who who runs the bodega across the street for the service he provides, right? And if I see him in harm and I can help him, like for me personally, I feel like it's my duty to do that as a member of this community, right? And if we're like starting to think about community in a much larger sense, right? And individuals who may have strayed from the idea of community, right? And it being our duty to help them sort of come back into the fold of community, right? Um, for me, I think that um, the more I see people falling into this um, trap of incarceration and reincarceration, that I, it's me letting them down because I know better and I should be helping to fix the issues that led, that lead to people's incarceration, right? Addressing the root causes of incarceration and not necessarily, you know, and not the after, right? So it, it's, it's a multi-pronged approach for me. And I think that um, if we start from community, if we start to really think of the community, like you, you said earlier in a larger sense, um, and treat people, and you know, and relate to people with love, from love and from this idea of personhood, that it's much easier to take that step to to act. Yeah, yeah, and I and I really do sincerely hope people get a chance to watch the documentary, uh, and even on a local level to get proximate, as uh, uh, Mr. Jewel had said earlier, how do we get close enough to see and understand? And by the time you finish the conversation. You're saying, hey, I, I like what we just did. Can I have another cup of coffee with you one of these days and have a chance to catch up? Because when people get a chance to connect, all of the stereotypes begin to wash away in the things that they heard and the things that um, are not uh, rooted in truth uh, cannot uh, take advantage of the opportunity. We have a question and I wanna lift this up. It's, and I'm, I wanna come to one with this. And then after that, I wanna ask, uh, sharing to join the conversation. But this question, uh, and it's very good in, in laying a foundation of some of what we've just talked about. As education helps us discover ourselves, could you please share with us how the education you got impacted the stereotypical ideas that burden and indoctrinated you and people around you before BPI? What have you done or what do you think would be the best way to help change those stigmas. Um, Duane, you I hope that you caught some of that uh, and uh, can kind of weed through that and give us a good response for a well-asked question. Yeah, I, I thank you. Someone's trying to take me back to school um, tonight. <laughs> um, in that question, um, I think at the heart of it just reminds me of a T.S. Eliot quote, and he says, you know, the goal of all exploration is to um, arrive where we began and to um, know it for the first time. Right, and so to get an education, the type of education, a Bard College education that you receive through BPI really paints the world anew for you, right? And completely changes what you think of as your opportunities in the world, right? I never expected to go to college, right? I didn't ever think I was someone who was gonna to go to college and I was sitting in prison and saw a segment of the Bard Prison Initiative on 60 Minutes in that segment, men like Jewel in prison, in green, black and brown men getting education inspired me and made me think, oh, wow, maybe there's a chance for me to go to college, right? And I got in BPI and that radically changed the trajectory of my life, right? And sometimes I have these very absurd conversations with people and I say, you know, well, I spent 12 years in prison. They're like, are you joking? is that a joke? That's not serious, right? Like you, you work at the DCCC, you've done X, Y, Z. You don't look like someone who's been to prison. You don't sound like someone who's been to prison, right? And I'm like, I had a whole Ken Burns documentary and I can show you that, right? And so when we talk about pushing back against stigmas and stereotypes, there's no better way to do that than people meeting individuals like myself, like Jewel, like Giovanni, than watching College Behind Bars, right? When Lynn and 
Sarah and Ken showed up at extra correctional facility, we weren't all excited. We didn't just say like, oh, hey, we want to be in a documentary, right? It, it wasn't an overnight decision. It wasn't a snap decision. You know, we had real debates with each other about how we would be depicted in popular culture and media, right? And we had to decide for ourselves that we wanted people, the best documentary filmmakers in the country to be able to tell a different type of story around who incarcerated people are and what they're capable of, right? Because so much of what you see in popular culture relies on the nastiest and most derogatory types of stereotypes and caricatures. And so we did the film and have taken the film all over the country and everywhere we go, people are sort of blown away by the substance of that documentary and by the people in it. And it changes how they think about prisons in this country, about education, um, about mass incarceration, about justice, about courts, about policing, so on and so forth, right? And so we, through our personal work, have been able to exemplify what we do through the documentary. And that documentary has done a ton to debunk a whole bunch of really, really harmful caricatures and stereotypes. Can I hop in here? Please go right ahead. Uh, go right ahead, Dr. Brown. Because, I mean, Daiwan, in the film, you say something that I think is really um, directly to this point. You say the last, you said the last thing that I want to be is a poster boy for what prison can do for you or something like that. And it was absolutely powerful. Like prison is not making us better. This is not. And, and there was and you worked hard for that degree and that just just having the same the access to college that um, that others do um, that's what enabled you to have access to the resources or access to sort of the the opening up I, I guess anyway I just wanted to thank you for saying that because I think that's super important in this conversation as well mm -hmm. um, no we, we can stay right there and really continue to talk about myth uh, breaking, uh, uh, kind of dismantling the misinformation, mi misinformation, the misnomers uh, that are out there about individuals who are living with uh, records, formerly incarcerated individuals, returning citizens, uh, and that whole process of uh, being fully who you are uh, in those spaces that allow people to see something different than perhaps what they've been prescribed. Uh, let's uh, let's let's take about another couple minutes here. I think this is a, a healthy conversation, and I just open it up. Anyone would like to add to the conversation? Yeah, I just want to state quickly, uh, in, in regards to that last question that was raised, I read it as this may be the answer. Uh, before I entered BPI, the education I received was hopelessness. Mm. I was it, in 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 the streets. I was able to have access to guns and drugs more than I could have uh, healthcare access, uh, a mentor, uh, uh, and education that was meaningful to me in my neighborhood. So I just wanna lift up that what we're doing now is showing that, and what college and education does writ large is provide hope to a lot of people who have been fed a narrative that, hey, you're hopeless, there's nothing for you except the streets. And what we're doing, and this is why I've been so proud to be a part of this project, is showing, no, that's not it. You can have hope. You can hit these books and come home and be a productive member of society, regardless of the narrative that's, that's being taught or being uh, espoused in the street. So I just wanted to lift, not necessarily lift up, but bring attention to that a lot of the young are given complex images of school isn't for you, but yeah. right around the corner, you could pick up a gun. So I think this is something that's systemic in our society that we do need to deal with and just wanted to bring attention to that. Well, I appreciate that. Dr. Varello, uh, this goes to you, individuals who may be watching this now and say, I want to do something. I want to get involved on a local level. We talked about the consortium and how it is a uh, network of individuals, institutions, uh, and interests that are being facilitated through a lot of people coming together. How and what should they do? I mean, maybe they're sitting on the edge of their seat now and say, I wanna do something. If those 
men and women that I've heard about today are pushing the way they are, doing what they have to do, making space that makes our community better. And I don't have half the challenges that they have had to confront. What should I do? Everybody, everybody can make progress forward in this point. And you have, and everybody, and you have to be willing to have your heart broken or healed. <laughs> like, so it's like, there's the whole range. Some people need to have their heart broken in order to really deeply understand this. You got to read Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow. That's absolutely required reading. And learning learning um, to, to overcome the stereotypes, like you said. So um, watching the documentary is a step forward. And believe it, it is absolutely true. I mean, that's a very representative documentary that shows what Augustana prison education program looks like. That's, you know, professors going into, into prisons, teaching good students, teaching people who want, really want to be involved, who are absolutely committed and don't take this education for granted, they don't. So watching those, reading books, writing a check to Augustana College for the APEP, I'm serious because it is completely privately funded. It is um, the Austin E. Knowlton Foundation funded us for about two years. There's no tuition dollars going to this and there's no tax dollars going to this. There should, I mean, I say that's the best way tax dollars could be spent because for every $1 spent on higher ed in prison, $5 is saved. It is a no brainer. People all over this country from, you know, um, are, you know, from across the political spectrum, know that this is healthy for communities. And so writing a check, volunteering is hard. Security issues are very, very hard, but um, it took it took everything, it took everybody from Steve Balls, from the president and the provost, and um, it, it took a community to get this program going and it was a nail biner. We could, we could easily have been turned away with the money, with a willing community, getting into prisons is hard and so just just supporting um those who do this work you don't have to rely on me or us to do something right so um i can help you figure out whatever that thing is so if somebody wants to contact me it's sharon varallo at augustana.edu and um one of my superpowers is seeing other people's gifts and talents Aww. and that's why i go into prison because i mean it is i see i mean it's just it I will help you figure out what it is that you, what, what you can do to move forward, okay? Um, so whatever you're already doing as well, you don't have to change who you are to do this work. If you're an accountant, hire someone without regard to their, you know, any past convictions. Offer internships in the community. There's, you know, don't, you know, don't, judge your children's friends. <laughs> I mean, anything, there's all kinds of ways that, that people can move forward. I'll stop. No, I hope that people take that uh, to heart and to get involved, change happens uh, on the local level. And with that said, I would be remiss if we did not get a chance to take one more question, but I wanna go to Dewan very quickly and ask him to maybe just give about a 45 second response to this. The legislation, we always say poverty essentially is a policy choice. That's my understanding of poverty. Everybody want to know what poor folks are doing for themselves, mostly everything. Uh, and that's why it's so hard to get out of poverty. They need uh, support. They need policies that are in their favor. Uh, Dr. King and his efforts with so many changed policy, the uh, Civil Rights Act, uh, 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 the Voting Rights Act of 65, 64 Civil Rights Act, and the Fair Housing Act that came right after his assassination. They wouldn't do it while he was alive, but you know he was an inconvenient hero after his assassination, and they passed it. Your, your thoughts very quickly in about forty-five seconds about legislation. I just want to touch this. Yeah. Um, so um, I run government affairs um, at the Bard Prison Initiative, and what that has meant over the past few years was, you know, first working um, both with Jewel and Giovanni and everyone in the film around Pell restoration at the federal level. Um, and so we did several screenings um, for members of Congress um, in DC and just built a lot of support for restoration all across the country. And if people don't know what that is, in 1994, federal government banned incarcerated people from accessing um, Pell Grants for the purpose of college and prison, right? We were able to reverse that ban at the end of 2020, right? And so that's really, really um, 
um, important legislation is going to have a national impact, but have also worked, you know, in New York, both at the New York City level as well as the state level to secure first time ever funding for college and prison as well as reentry on behalf of BPI. Um, I have worked to incentivize college and prison in New York through legislation, and I can do this pretty fast because I've talked to a ton of legislators about it. But for example, if you were incarcerated in New York, you get out of prison early for earning a GED for um, participating in a vocational program and earning a prison certificate that's non-transferable to the job market for spending 400 hours quite literally shoveling snow, right, on an outside work crew. They'll let you out of prison early. You couldn't get out of prison early for earning a college degree, right? And the system is set up that way to disincentivize college learning, right? Um, and so I was able to add college and prison to the maritime eligibility criteria. Um, and right now I'm working um, with a whole coalition in New York on what we call a turn on the tap campaign, which is gonna to restore tuition assistance programming funding to incarcerated people. And so after the Pell ban in 1994, New York um, instituted a tap ban in 1995 that made incarcerated people ineligible for state level aid. And so after a lot of work over the past three years, the governor just announced in her state of the state earlier this month that she's gonna restore tap money to incarcerated people in her executive budget this year. Right, so legislation is super important. And I think the answer to that question double tails to one that was in the chat around, you know, how individuals like myself and Jewel and Giovanni have been using our educations back in the community. And those are some examples um, of just that, right? Leveraging our educations and our experience, right? To create change in the world. Thank you, I'm gonna to move to this question uh, part of my responsibility is to bring the big ship back into port on time. Uh, but with that said, I don't want to miss this wonderful question that, and it, it's a specific question. So, uh, Joel, I'm going to ask that you follow up on this one, sir. African American males are struggling in school and from bad grades and connecting with the school and peers and staying in school itself. Do you, do you have advice for educators to help these students? Yes, let's get some. Uh formerly incarcerated, barred alumni in these classes to show these students that, you know, we lived that life and it wasn't productive and how education can be productive in our life. That was a bit of a plug, but I would say we need to get uh, these students with their peers. They need to see people who look like them and see that they're doing things constructive because they have, it's, I really commend teachers, you have an uphill battle with the streets. Like I said, I was, I, I found when I was growing up in my community, Brownsville, Brooklyn, I felt the streets was better than school. And my teachers were great. But the work wasn't challenging. So uh, I think we did one, one re resolution to that could be let's get more people like me, Dawan, Giovanni, in these schools to talk to these kids and tell our stories so that they could see that there is another way and the streets isn't the only way. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, we have our call to action. So many people have been asking, what can I do? Great questions, advice on uh, taking steps toward a better classroom. Dr. Monica Smith is the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion at Augustana College. She's gonna give us our call to action, Dr. Smith. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you so much, Reverend Dwight, for moderating such a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you to everyone who coordinated this, this program and to our guest speakers. This year, Martin Luther King Jr. Day is on the eve of the National Day of Racial Healing. I want us to be mindful of the commitment and progress that we've made toward justice, but also to consider what needs to be done to ensure justice through equal practices that lead to equitable outcomes. We've heard tonight how living in under-resourced communities and dual education systems adversely impact residents, uh, and those situations have created the so-called, have created and fueled, excuse me, the so-called school-to-prison pipeline. The ACLU reports zero tolerance policies criminalize minor infractions of school rules, while cops in school lead to students being criminalized for behavior that should be handled inside the school. Children with learning disabilities or histories of poverty, abuse, or neglect are isolated, punished, and pushed out of our schools. And students of color in particular 
are especially vulnerable to push out trends and the discriminatory application of this uh, discipline. In fact, Black students represent 31% of school-related arrests. Black students are suspended and expelled three times more than white students. Students suspended or expelled for discretionary violations are nearly three times more likely to be in contact with juvenile justice systems the following year. And there you have it, the school to prison pipeline. Fighting injustice in part means paying attention to how race and economics historically and contemporarily functions in creating disparate outcomes for members of our communities. As we said earlier, societal redemption is necessary. And so we must acknowledge and work to change social systems that lead to incarceration and punitive prisons. Dr. King's legacy, his fight for justice is one of political advocacy. Transformation comes through individual and community actions. You might know that last week, Dr. King's family said that we should no longer celebrate Dr. King, Martin Luther King Day, unless and until we have a Voting Rights Act. And what a better way to honor and celebrate Dr. King's legacy than to take up his mantle and demand voting rights for all. As I said, voter suppression disparately disadvantages people of color and those who live in and experience po poverty. In the words of Dr. King, it's not possible to favor justice for some and not be in favor for justice for all. So voting in our local, state, and federal elections, political power, that is, changes systems that change lives and can and will impact education and economics, among other issues. So I encourage you tonight to contact your local senators and demand passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Also, uh, the Freedom to Vote Act, which would make it easier, for for easier to register to vote and recognize election day as a public holiday. I think today Dr. King would remind each of us to make a career of humanity, to commit ourselves to the struggle for equal rights. Societal redemption, social justice means concerning ourselves with every aspect of the human experience and working to restore humanity such that every person has a dignified existence and full access to society's goods and services, as well as full part participation in society as a valued member of our global community. So please take up this mantle, hear the call to action, contact your senators to pass these important civil rights and voting rights legislation. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for giving us uh how we should position ourselves for the future and what uh, we can do to make a change uh, on the local level and participate in change making. Sometimes we believe that our one action is not going to turn the tide. However, uh, that one action is a participatory effort to be a part of something that's bigger than you. And then without your help cannot be done. We just need a critical mass so that we can, in fact, uh, have a movement that is tipping the scale in the right direction. Uh, I got one more question, and I would love for our guests to be willing to entertain this final question. I don't want to leave any question uh, in the queue. We can work with it, uh, and we'll be short in our response. But that one question is very simple. Uh, I want to give it to you. Uh, I've watched uh, the documentary, and I can appreciate the transformation nature and how higher learning has affected you gentlemen. And I appreciate being, it being a formerly incarcerated person who's previously participated in a prison education program. This question is for any of the formerly inc incarcerated gentlemen. We're pulling the last part of it. The formerly incarcerated gentlemen, how has education propelled you into becoming an agent for social change in the communities from which you come from? or possibly new communities. And I think I'll stop right there. That's the, the, the gist of it. How has your experiences, your education uh, propelled you to be that change agent in your communities or a new community? We've heard some of it, but just in case one of you would like to take uh, another step in this, I wanna give about 40 seconds for this answer. Critical thinking and writing. I found that, you know, no slight to my colleagues at the Ford Foundation, but I, I basically could write better than many of my colleagues <laughs> at Ford. <laughs> so critical thinking and writing. Uh, we'll bring this to 
a conclusion as we are getting ready for a wonderful song that lift our hearts as we prepare for our exit. But thank you so much, Dr. Borello, uh, your time and investment, and of course with Augustana's prison, ed prison education program uh, is something that you'll know, you'll see us uh, and our team alongside of you for the work. And we're so proud of what you have founded and started. And of course, to Mr. Dewan uh, Tadro, thank you so much, Mr. Jewel Hall. We appreciate your investment. Mr. Giovanni Hernandez, thank you so much, sir, for all that you have brought to the table. Um, how do we get out of such a conversation? One of my favorite, one of my absolute favorite uh, novels and plays. Uh, anybody that spends any time with me would know I'm going to talk about Lorraine Hansberry's 1959 uh, award winning play, uh, A Raisin in the Sun. Well, Walter Lee Younger, of course, the great Sidney Poitier, who now rests with the ancestors, feels as if his dream is not possible. Frustrated in a moment of despair, uh, at the moment of breaking, he says, Sometimes it's like I can see the future stretched out in front of me. Just as plain as day, the future, mama, hanging over there, just the edge of my days, just waiting for me. A big, looming, blank space, full of nothing, just waiting for me. But it don't have to be. That last clause, it changes everything for me. It doesn't have to be the way it is. Regardless of what we're confronting as a community, what you are confronting as an individual, it doesn't have to be the way it is. So we're going to work for a change. As a matter of fact, Charlotte Boy is going to take us out where the change is going to come. Have a great evening and thank you for joining us. I was born by the river in a little old tent. Oh, when just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know change gonna come. Oh, yes. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. Cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long, a long time coming. But I know change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Said I'd go to the movies and I go down town. And someone keep telling me, do Hang around It's been a long A long time coming But I know Change gonna come Oh, yes it will Then I go I see, brother, help me, please. Oh, help me, please. Then he winds up, he winds up knocking me. Oh, down on my knees. Oh, there's been time. Couldn't 
make them able to carry on, spend a long, a long time coming, but I know change gonna come, oh yes it will. Change gonna come.